So I'm Nick Grayson, I'm the uh, Climate Change and Sustainability Manager from Birmingham City Council and we've been working on uh, a development site tool based on ecosystem services for the past year stroke 18 months which we want to share with you today and the lessons learned from that and it's still building we haven't got all the answers yet um, but um, we're going to look at it from four different perspectives I'm looking at it from a sort of city policy point of view what's it mean to a city to have such a tool um, we have Oliver with us who's a environmental economist who's helped build the tool and wants to explain it to you in more detail. We have Chris from Skanska, who have trialled the tool on an industrial site outside of Birmingham. And finally, we have Rupert from a community group in the city who are wanting to make use of that same data and uh, information at a community scale. So we want to share those perspectives with you and then at the end we'll happily take questions. So, um, if you don't know Birmingham, um, and it seems surprising that quite a lot of people don't, um, it's obviously got a reputation as being an industrial city, but it's got current day aspirations, uh, serious ones, to be a global green city. And in the recent publications of the leaders' statements and our planning documents, that is basically writ large into the future we're wanting to create for the city. Um, we have uh, created or initiated two different commissions, a smart commission and a green commission to help inform that process. They're people out with of the council, they're, they're uh, the great and the good, the intellectuals, the academics, the people with uh, who can bring added value and knowledge to that process. And for both of those arenas, the smart city and the green city, we've created vision documents. Um, we've also published, just this last year, a green living spaces plan, which was the first time that we introduced an ecosystem services approach to the city. Seven new principles locked in across our planning framework. And it introduced the idea of natural capital in terms of how we wanted to take the city forward. That was built up through a whole process of um, working with a huge range of different partners. This is part of the whole equation these days, is that um, a single discipline is not going to solve the issue, and that in fact, to create joined up policy, you need to draw on a huge range of different disciplines, different experiences. So we've done that um, across a very broad range uh, of different areas, looking at people's evidences, where they overlap, how that can be linked into joined up policy, and ultimately into joined up and different delivery mechanisms. The starting point for that was understanding the climate impact on Birmingham. Obviously, huge amount of press coverage around climate change, but what does it actually mean at a local scale in a city? And Birmingham is now the most mapped and monitored city in the world in relation to urban heat and climate change, which might come as a surprise. So we've got a very sophisticated working model now that takes us forward to 2100 with all the various scenarios, and we can drill down to a neighborhood scale overlaying a whole raft of environmental, ecological, um, economic and social factors so we can say where, who and why those impacts are going to happen in the city, which is very important in terms of decision making. It happened to win the Lord Stafford Award in 2012. Another big issue that all cities are wrestling with at the moment is the whole conundrum of public health and the relationship between all those urban factors and our well-being, which is absolutely enormous. When you look at the league tables of cities, they don't make healthy reading, particularly uh, amongst the younger populations Birmingham unfortunately tops the league in terms of childhood asthma and in terms of obesity. 40% of our primary school children are clinically obese. That is a generational time bomb and it's something that has to be unlocked and understood. But it completely relates to spatial planning and the whole issue 
of how you create and manage and maintain a city. And in fact, internationally, Ban Ki-moon has highlighted the non-communicable diseases as being the number one health risk around the world. So one of the things that's helped us understand these issues more closely is to use the national ecosystem assessment methodology and science to actually drill that down at a city scale, the first city in the UK to do that. So we've actually mapped the city from our dependency on the natural environment. So a supply and demand approach, where the population is, what's the natural environment providing for us in terms of all these multiple benefits? How is it supporting our efforts or our requirements in relation to local climate, education, recreation, um, health and well-being, a whole range of different issues. And it's given us a new insight into understanding the city from that perspective. And when you actually combine all those GIS, GIS maps, you can create a single multiple challenge map of the city. This hasn't been done anywhere else in the world, and other international cities are very interested in this approach, because it gives you a completely fresh view and this connection between all the various things that are going on and the city's dependency on its natural environment. Just juxtaposed to that is the map that the public health services use all over the country to actually assess the ultimate progress um, of public health services, which is called the excess years life lost. So in other words, as an average citizen, UK citizen, you'd expect to live a certain amount of years, but that life expectancy is compromised by your location and by your lifestyle to the degree of eight years for men, 11, sorry, eight years for women, 11 years for men in our worst wards. And so you get these areas of darker color, which make interesting comparisons with this work we've done in relation to the natural environment. So it's setting a whole range of different scenes in terms of all these overlaps and connectivities. We've joined those together through these seven overarching key principles that are running through our planning uh, framework now, um, which looks at the city across these broad agendas and tries to look at how we can join these things together. If you break those maps down into a district level, you can start to look at the local impact and where the areas of greatest need are. And we've been sharing and using that information and data set with community groups, which Rupert is going to pick up on, because there's the huge potential of third sector and community groups to work at a local level from a bottom-up approach in terms of addressing some of these concerns. And if we take that information at a city scale um, and think about future development and development sites, how could we use that same sort of approach and thinking in terms of looking at the carrying capacity of a development site in relation to not only the natural environment and the ecosystem services, but all the benefits that that has to offer over a much longer time frame. So we've built this model, which is called a natural capital city tool. Perhaps we'll have to come up with something snappier. Then we did it through, we started doing it through the Ecosystems Markets Task Force, but we've continued doing it funded by DEFRA, and it's actually going to be used and published within the National Ecosystem Assessment Follow-on Project as an example of how to sort of implement um, that whole approach of an ecosystem services um, science. Essentially what you're looking at is how dependent are you on the natural environment on a particular site, what are the potential benefits you could draw from that, and once you've started to ask and answer those questions, what it opens up is that there's potential stakeholders that could be drawn into that development who could be potential co-investors, albeit that they'd be interested in a different return on investment period and so it changes the dynamic in terms of what you're trying to achieve at a site scale within a development. And again, this is something that Chris with Skanska have looked at outside of Birmingham on a very big industrial uh, development they're looking at. So as a city, that's the sort of direction of travel we've been taking. And it might seem a bit out of the norm. So are there any other people 
exploring this same territory? Well, yes, there are. And in fact, we've been working through this whole process with the UK Business Council for Sustainable Development, UK BCSD. I don't know if you know them, but if you don't, check them out. They're the UK satellite of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, who, together with TEEB, have been looking at this whole international issue of natural capital. And of course, within the UK, with the introduction of the Natural Environment White Paper, a government advisory group was established called the Natural Capital Committee, who will report next week with their second annual report, March the 11th, on progress so far, on how they can integrate natural capital into the economic growth of the UK. And they report directly to the Economic Affairs Subcommittee, which is chaired by the Chancellor. It's a huge challenge. But what they're looking to publish in their final third year report in spring of next year is a natural capital plan for England. How you can actually join up all these resources, map the economic impacts, and therefore look at, over a longer time frame, a 25 year time frame, how you can actually join the dots in terms of our dependency on natural capital. So we've been liaising and working alongside the natural capital, and as a city, what we're also hoping to do is co-produce and co-publish a 25-year natural capital plan for the city of Birmingham that'll take the same approach and the same evidence bases and the same long-term view, but actually connect these whole environmental and social issues and link them into the whole economic process of how we take the city forward. That's obviously quite an ambitious process. Um, it's locked within a much wider framework of work that these commissions have been working on, which is a published carbon roadmap, which in old money you would have called a sustainability plan. But obviously, carbon is the um, currency of today, and so it's a carbon roadmap. And there's a whole chapter in there relating to natural capital and this whole process of how we want to take things forward. Finally, as part of the sort of recognition of this work, if you like, there's a new network, a new global network of cities established in October last year called the Biophilic Cities Network, which is really like a research community who are bringing together academic research in planning, health and well-being, and development, together with their cities, and looking at this whole agenda going forward on an international scale. And it opens up the possibility of new future investment models around biophilic cities that are focusing their future on this type of an agenda, which then locks in and future-proofs climate change alongside health and well-being, growth, prosperity, and the dynamics of economic development. So there are global investors interested in this whole dynamic as well. So there's, it's just wanting to share with you where we're going with this. Um, but the essential part of this discussion now will focus on this natural capital city site tool, how we've devised it. Oliver will go through that in some detail. Chris will then expand on how that's been applied on a site to give you some insight into that. And finally, Rupert will come on to talk about how the community have and want to make further use of this information so that you can get a bottom-up and a top-down process happening in the city. So at that point, we'll save all the questions to the end if we can. Um, I'll hand over to Oliver to go through the tool in more detail.